Well, good morning. It's September. You made it. Congrats. Um, it's good to be here with you this morning. Uh, my name is Steve Ruffner. I'm one of the pastors here. Um, yeah, I'm just excited. There's so many people here on a holiday weekend. Normally, uh, things kind of shrink down a bit uh, on a holiday, but we got a nice full house. Um, my family, I don't know about you, my family has this little tradition. We usually go up to Van Wert County and go to the Van Wert County Fair. Like, it's a fair that my wife used to go to as she was growing up. Her, her mom's family is from Van Wert. Small, she says it's the best county fair in all of Ohio, so... If you want something to do over the weekend, one more day. So, fan work. Just a little helpful tip. Well, um, as David mentioned, we are kicking off a study in the book of Romans. Um, I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. This is going to be a nice year-long study, uh, really getting into a book that has just such deep truths and such, such deep meaning for us as believers. Um, so we kicked it off last week. Pastor Greg gave us, Pastor Greg gave us the uh, introduction uh, to the book, um, which you know some of us as we we've maybe we've studied it in the past and we think of Romans as uh, just one of those. It's a, it's a big book compared to a lot of uh, Paul's other letters, and we just see the deep theological stuff in it, and it kind of goes over our head. Uh, but we really hope to make this a very accessible book and a very accessible study for us. Um, you know, it's a letter written to specific people to address very specific issues. Um, and as Greg told us, that in it, the gospel is explained, it is defended, and it is applied. Uh, and to the people that he wrote it to, it's being applied to this idea of conflict and tensions between Jew and Gentile. So, um, and we'll certainly see over time how applicable that is for us uh, even today. So, I hope you do get a chance to do the study with us. Grab a notebook um, and use it. And even the notes that you have today can kind of fit in it. Because even though we're not really doing the series today, we're really kicking it off next week. Um, today's sermon somewhat applies because one of the things that we're encouraging us all to do while we do the study of Romans together is to memorize some verses together. Um, there's a couple of verses and inside your notebook on the front cover, the yellow page in it, has a list of the verses that we'll be doing together. And several of those verses can be grouped together to form what is commonly called the Romans Road. How many of you have ever heard of the Romans Road before? Good. Lots of good hands. So, um, well, today we're going to actually talk about that. And why are we encouraging people to learn these verses? To, um, you know, People all around the world, and missionaries, and pastors, and evangelists, and, and lay people um, all around the world, learn these verses, learn the Roman road to help them share their faith with other people. Um, and we, we talk about this a lot, uh, even David mentioned this earlier, that our mission as a church is to honor God and to love people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And one of the, the best ways that we know to do that, you know, one of the ways that we help people grow into a relationship with Jesus Christ is to ensure that they have a relationship with Jesus, right? It all starts with having that relationship. Um, and so we take seriously the command, the great commission to go and make disciples. So we start... By sharing the love of Jesus, helping people come to faith, and then helping them grow in their faith uh, and become, like, become more like him. But sharing our faith is something that is not that easy for a lot of us, right? It's one of those things that, that some, for some of us, it's a hurdle that we have to 
get over to talk about Jesus. It's very easy for us to talk about sports and Michigan crushing Colorado State yesterday. And um, you guys aren't talking about that? Uh, yeah. Huh. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Evan. That was, that was for you. Um, I, I heard Ohio State did something yesterday, too. But yeah. Anyway. Um, what was I talking about? No. Uh, <laughs> we can talk about sports and a whole lot of other things pretty easily, but when it comes to talking about Jesus, for some reason, it's really hard. You know, one of the things that we did last winter semester is we hosted a perspectives class, which is about uh, evangelism, about sharing our faith, and what it's like for people all around the world to hear about Jesus. Do you know that there are more than 17,000 people groups in the world? So not just countries and different ethnicities, but people groups. Distinct groups of people with their own language uh, and, and culture and belief systems and things like that. There are 17,427 by the last count. Of those people groups, there are 7,414 unreached. That's almost half of the people groups in the world don't have access to the gospel. They don't have a core group of people who are believers within their community. They're completely unreached. That's 42 and a half percent of our population don't know about Jesus and don't have access to the gospel. Now, our population right now, by last count, is 7.9 billion people. 3.3 billion people are unreached. And 42.5% don't know Jesus. And we have the privilege of being able to share Jesus with everybody that we come in contact with. And that's why we want us as a church to learn the Romans road. So that we know what the gospel is and how we can communicate it with others in a very easy and a clear way. So before we get into it, why don't we just pray and just get our hearts right and ask God to be with us this morning. So. Father, we come before you this morning thankful for who you are, thankful that you have sent Jesus for us to pay the penalty for our sin, and that, and that by some work of your grace that we have had the privilege of growing up hearing about Jesus, and that the gospel is, has been accessible to us. And that many of us in this room have come to know Jesus as our Savior and Lord. But we know that that is not true all around the world. And God, we certainly know that it's not true even just within our own community. That there are still many, many people who don't know Jesus. So God, help us just as we um, open up your word and we we look at some of these very simple truths uh, that, that you would soften our hearts uh, to the great calling that you have for us to tell others about you. So, Father, thank you. May my words be your words this morning. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to start with just a, a, a few things that, you know, maybe when it comes to sharing our faith, that you know, a lot of times they're just excuses that we have, some objections we have to sharing our faith. And so if you have your notes, um, got a whole bunch of blanks for you to fill in today. Um, and again, those, those notes, we had them three hole punch so that if you're doing the Roman series with us, you can put them in to the notebook with us. But so... And there's going to be a lot more objections than what I'm going to put here. But th these are some of the most common ones of why people don't share their faith. And the first one is 
people would say, well, I just don't know any unbelievers. You know, we live in America. Everybody's heard about Jesus, so what do I need to say? Or I just don't know anybody. And I kind of get that, you know, in, in our Christian culture, in our church culture, that we tend to be pretty isolated. You know, all of our friends are Christians from church. We send our kids to Christian schools, and then after school they do activities with other Christian families and their kids. Um, some of us work for Christians in the, in the business place. Other of us work for Christian ministries. We hang out in Christian-owned coffee shops where lots of other Christians tend to hang out too. You know, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I like going to Coffee Hub. That's a great place to go. But it can be pretty isolating sometimes if, if our entire world is focused just around Christians. But it's not just the church that's isolating, right? Um, our culture is become increasingly isolated as well. We can order fast food from our phones. And it can either be delivered to us or we could drive to the restaurant, walk in, pick up a bag off the shelf, walk back out to our car and never talk to anybody. We do the same thing with groceries and library books and just about anything else. Like we don't have to interact with anybody. You know, for some of the introverts out there, that's a really great thing, right? But, but at times it can be pretty isolating as well. Just this week, I had to go to Lowe's and Walmart a couple of times. And the first errand I had to run, I walked into the store. And I had like six things I had to pick up. And I walked around the entire store, picked up everything I needed to, walked over to the self-checkout lane, checked out, walked out to the car, and I realized that I was in that store for 15 minutes. And I didn't talk to a single person. I barely made eye contact with people. Part of it was me, part of it was other people just looking down as well, but I really, that's just not a great way to live. And so the next time I went to the store, I intentionally went to a different lane just so I could say hi to somebody, just so that I could say, hey, can I pray for you? Is there something I can pray for you about? Like, just so I would intentionally have a chance to interact with other people. Sometimes we have to be pretty intentional about interacting with unbelievers. You know, we tend to think that because Xenia is a small town and people are pretty friendly, that most of the people in the town are probably believers. Um, you know, that's just not the case, right? As, as, as Sarah knows, right? <laughs> um, our mayor knows that not everybody is a believer in our town. Um, but, you know, you, if you've been around here long enough, you've heard Pastor Will say that there are 80 churches, 80 Christian churches in our town. So let's just do the math a little bit. The, the population of Xenia, I think, is somewhere around 26,000, 27,000. Let's not short us here. 20, 27,000 people. So if the 80 churches in our town average about 111, 120 people or so, you know, and we have more than that here, but there's a lot of churches in our town that don't average more than 20 or 30 people. But if most of our churches average about 110, 120 people, and all 120 people were genuine followers of Jesus, that's really only about a third of the population of the city of Xenia that are churchgoers. And again, we're assuming that all of the churchgoers are actual believers in Jesus. That's a third of the population of our city, which means that when you go into Walmart and don't make eye contact with people, that two out of, uh, two out of the three people that you could possibly interact with don't have any connection to a church in town. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that they're not a believer. But odds are that if they're not connected to a faith community, they, they probably don't know Jesus. 
So the fact that we say that we don't know any unbelievers means that we're just not out there and we're just not looking and we're just not trying to interact with people who don't know Jesus. So that might be one objection. Another objection is that I just don't see the need. Like, well, why do I need to tell people about Jesus? You know, this is an interesting one because it could take several different forms. It could be just that a person is a, a new, a young believer, and they just don't know that talking about Jesus is something that he would want us to do. I just don't know that there's a need. Like, so they haven't gotten into this idea of sharing their faith. Or it could be that a person takes a theological stance or a theological perspective that, that God's going to save everyone he has chosen and predestined. And so if God chose them, and he knew before the world began that they were going to come to Jesus, that they were going to become a believer, well, then why should I have to tell other people about him? Like, if he chose them and he predestined them, then I, I don't need to say anything. You know, it's all about God, and he'll do the work. Well, to my reformed five-point Calvinist brothers in Christ, I just... My response to that would be, that's just incomplete theology. You know, if I knew him well, I'd probably tell him that's really bad theology. But it's just incomplete. That yes, he predestined, he chose. But then we still have that choice, and God calls us to be a part of, of sharing Christ with others. And so we may not see the need, but as we just talked about a few minutes ago with the percentages of unreached people groups, like the need is huge. And if you have the cure to cancer, you'd want to tell people about it, right? You wouldn't just keep it to yourself. If you saw a child in the middle of the road, unaware of the car that's zooming in their direction, you'd do everything you can to yell at that child and get out of the road. Yet, there is a lost and dying world. And again, just for illustration's sake, two-thirds of our city, possibly, who don't know Jesus. And yet, a lot of times, we just sit on our hands and do nothing. We don't say a word. Well, a third objection could be that it's, it's just not my job. It's not my gift. You know, it's, it's not for me to do. That's the pastor's job or, or the person of somebody like Billy Graham, somebody who's an evangelist. Those are the really gifted people and they're the ones who should be talking about, about Jesus. But I've heard it said this, uh, this way, that evangelism is not a professional job for a few trained people. Instead, it is the relentless responsibility of every person who belongs to Jesus. Let me say this one more time. Evangelism is not a professional job for a few trained people. Instead, it is the relentless responsibility of every person who belongs to Jesus. Sharing our faith is something that we can all do. Let me share just one last objection, and it's probably the most common one. And this one I totally get, because even as a trained missionary and as a person in the pastorate, oftentimes we just say, oh, I'm just afraid. You know, we're fearful, and our fear keeps us from telling other people about Jesus. And in my opinion, there are two things that all of our fears can kind of be boiled down to. And one is just a fear of being rejected. And the other one is the fear of saying the wrong thing. You know, our fear of rejection means that often we just care too much about what other people think about us. And that keeps us from talking about it. And so that keeps us silent. You know, but it's not like we live in North Africa or the Middle East or something like that where a believer, if you talk about your faith, 
can get you kicked out of your family or kicked out of your community or have your tongue cut off or be persecuted or even be killed. It's not like that here in the States. Our fear of rejection is that people might think that we're a Jesus freak of some sorts or they might think that you know, we're one of those Bible thumpers or that we're too judgmental or, or anything like that. And the other thing that we can be afraid of is that we're afraid of saying the wrong thing. That often we don't know what to say or how to say it clearly when it comes to talking about our faith. A lot of us grew up in the church and if we were to, somebody were to ask us direct questions about our faith, we could probably answer them from the Bible and give you know, the Sunday school answers. But if somebody were to come up to us and ask us, well, what does it mean to become a Christian? How can I become a Christian? A lot of us just wouldn't know what to say. That was me. I grew up in a Christian home. I went to a Christian school. I memorized a ton of Bible verses growing up in Awana. And my first chance that I had to share my faith when I was in college, you know, I thought, oh, this is something I should do. Um, I had been going out with a friend, and together we would share our faith. Really, he shared his faith while I sat quietly and prayed. Um, I'd like to say that I really was, but I probably wasn't. I was probably just watching most of the time. And so when he challenged me to share my faith with somebody, I attempted it, and I was like, I don't know what to say. I don't even know where to start. And I had a little track with me, and I didn't know what to do. And I kind of jokingly say this, because I know theologically it's not true, but I jokingly say that if that person died and went to hell, it would be my fault, because as a Christian who had grown up in the church, I did not know how to tell them about Jesus. And that's why we want you to, to memorize the Romans Road. This is the way that we are encouraging us as a church to have confidence and knowing what it is we believe and how we can communicate that with other people with clarity and with certainty that this is what the Bible says. So, all right, so let's jump into it. That was a long introduction, but uh, fortunately, the verses that we're getting you to memorize are short, and they're easy to understand. So, so what is the Romans road? So here are some, some of the blanks for you to fill in. Now, obviously, the Romans road is not a physical road. Maybe I shouldn't say that, obviously, because, you know, in some faiths, you have to take a pilgrimage pilgrimage to Mecca in order for you to have a right standing with God, right? And so we're not saying you have to go down a road to Rome, although going to Rome is a pretty good thing, pretty cool place, but it's not a physical road. Instead, it is a series of Bible verses from the book of Romans that lays out God's plan of salvation. And then when you share these verses together, they form an easy, systematic way of explaining the biblical message of salvation in Jesus Christ. So it's easy. It's easy to remember. It's something that's clear. You know, it's systematic. It, it, it covers all the bases of really what the Bible has to say about how a person can come to know Jesus. And it's the biblical message of salvation. It, it's not just our thoughts and opinions. And it's not just our testimony, as good as that is to help people understand what the gospel could do to our lives. But it really is, it's that biblical message. And we want you to learn these verses in, in part because they kind of get to the 
the core of our beliefs and that they're meaningful for us to understand and have scripture in our hearts. Um, but it's that way of being able to communicate this message as well. And we'll say this, it's not the only way that you can share your faith. You know, I'm on staff with Campus Crusade for Christ and we tend to use the four spiritual laws. Um, but there are lots of other things that people use to help them communicate the gospel message. Billy Graham had his five steps to peace with God. Um, you could use the five fish app. Um, and you could use the, the, the colorful bracelet that we've given out uh, lots of times here at the church. Or, or the bridge diagram or the wordless book or any of those things. And all these things are just tools that you could put into your, your toolbox your mental toolbox of, uh, to help give you a framework when telling somebody how they can have a relationship with God. Dr. Bill Bright, when he created the four spiritual laws for Campus Crusade, said that the four spiritual laws were the distilled essence of the gospel. Basically, if you took all the words of the Bible and you distilled them down to what the gospel is all about, you would get the four points of the four spiritual laws. And in the same way, that's what the Romans wrote is. You take the entirety of the gospel and, and all that it has to say about us as human beings and about who God is and what God did, and you distill that down, you would have these series of verses that you could use to share your faith. So the, four, the, the Romans wrote answers four basic questions. And this is really the heart of what we're going to talk about here. So the first step along the path, along the Romans road, answers this question. Who needs salvation? And the verses that go with this are Romans 3, 10, and 23. So let's read this together, shall we? As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So who needs salvation? Well, we all do. Everyone. The Romans road begins with the truth that everyone needs salvation because we've all sinned. Nobody gets a free ride because every person is guilty before God. We all fall short. We all miss the mark. You know, in order for us to have a relationship with God who is holy and perfect and completely righteous, we would need to be holy and perfect and completely righteous. But there's none of us that do that. If you, if you don't think that this applies to you, Ask your roommate or your spouse. They'll, they'll tell you that this applies to you. We've all sinned. Sin is that idea of missing the mark. And we all miss the mark on a pretty regular basis. And you probably won't get a whole lot of people who would disagree with that. People are like, yeah, I've done wrong things. You've done wrong things. We're all in the same boat. So what's the big deal? And that's where the second verse comes into play. And the second question that is answered is, why do we need salvation? And again, I'm going to go over these rather quickly, simply because, well, one, we're going to be talking about all these verses in greater detail as we do the Roman series as a whole. Uh, but just to give you an overview of, of the verses as well. So why do we need salvation? And that's the second step along the way. Is Romans 6.23 is the verse that goes along with this. And so again, let's read this together. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages of sin. What is a wage? Right? It's what you earn. You go to work, you get a paycheck, and on your pay stub or your W-2, it says that your wages are far less than you wanted, right? 
But your employer isn't just giving you money out of the kindness of your, his heart or her heart. He's giving you a paycheck because you earned it. You did the work. At least you put in the hours. Hopefully you did the work while putting in the hours. That was your wage. That's what you earned for your work. Well, the wage of our sin is death. What we've earned for our sin is a death penalty. The punishment we deserve is both physical and spiritual death. And that spiritual death is just eternal separation from God. And thus we need his salvation to escape the deadly eternal consequences of our sin. That's why we need salvation. Because otherwise we would spend an eternity apart from God. But this verse also tells us another thing. It tells us that even though we've earned death, that God has a gift for you. You know, a gift, it's, a gift isn't something you earn, right? It, it's something that people give you because they love you. I mean, maybe you've earned it because you hit a milestone in your birthday and, and people, you know, want to celebrate that for you. You feel like you've earned this, I've turned another year older, right? But really the gift is because they love you, not because you've actually earned that gift. And God's gift to us is eternal life in Jesus. Now, that, that's a pretty interesting concept. And again, we'll, we'll talk much more about this as we hit our Romans series. But eternal life in Jesus? Like, what does Jesus have to do with it? And that's really the third step along the Romans road. Is how does God provide salvation? So let's read this verse together, Romans 5, 8. Says, but God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How did he provide it? How did he provide salvation? Well, he sent Jesus to die for us. We earned a death penalty that was the price that somebody needed to pay. But we're all guilty. We're all under a death penalty. Now, I would love for somebody to pay my death penalty for me. But reality is, Matt can't pay for my death penalty because Matt's under a death penalty himself. And I can't pay for your death penalty because I'm under a death penalty. It'd be like if we all had traffic tickets and we went into court and we said, you know what, I'm going to go pay, I want to pay for their traffic ticket. And the judge is looking at it like, their, their traffic ticket is more than you can afford. And by the way, you owe a traffic ticket as well. So any money you give me is going to go toward your traffic ticket. Like, like, we need somebody who doesn't owe a traffic ticket to pay for our traffic ticket. And that's what this is about. Jesus Christ could do this. Jesus, who lived a perfect, sinless life, wasn't under a death penalty. And when he died for our sins, his death paid the full price for our salvation. And through the death and resurrection of God's own son, the debt that we owed was satisfied. And it says he did it while we were still sinners. Like, we didn't have to get cleaned up. We didn't have to get our acts together. We didn't have to, like, you know, get all nice and pretty and come into church and do all these good things before he would save us. No, he did this when we were his enemies. When we were still sinners, he paid for our death penalty with his own death. And so this leads us to the fourth question that is answered. Is that how do we receive salvation? And so there are uh, two verses in this. And let's read these together as well. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 
For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. The key things there is that if you declare, if you confess, and believe. We acknowledge that Jesus is who he says he is and believe that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. We don't come to God on our own terms. We don't get to pick and choose what we want to believe about Jesus. Take this about him, but I'll reject this about him. We take Jesus for who he is, what the Bible says about him. We acknowledge that he is Lord, that he's God's son, and we believe that not only did he die on the cross, but he rose from the dead to seal the deal. And we don't receive salvation by trying to earn it. We don't receive salvation because we come to church or put money in the offering plate or because we help the poor or, or because we're, we have more good deeds than we have bad deeds. We receive the gift by believing in God. That's what faith is what belief is. That's what trust is. And these are the steps along the Romans road. Who needs salvation? Why do we need salvation? How does God provide salvation? And how do we receive it? But you know, there are times like when you're using your GPS, you know, you're trotting along, you have a place punched in, and then all of a sudden you say, you know what? You know, there's that little thing, you know, like at a stop along the way. Hopefully your passenger's doing that for you and you're not doing it while you're driving. Uh, I'm going to give you one more. We're going to add a stop along the way, uh, along the Romans Road. And that last one is, what are the results of salvation? So there are two different verses, uh, two series of verses that kind of go along with this. And so let's read the first one. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. And then one more, Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what are the results of salvation? Is that we come into a relationship with God. And we are at peace with God. And when we accept God's gifts, we have the reward of knowing that we'll never be condemned for our sin. We are free from the power of sin and death. We are free from the penalty of sin because Jesus paid that for us. We are promised eternal life with God. And we are forever united with God the Father through the love he has shown us in Jesus Christ that nothing will ever separate us from it. Even when we're jerks, we're not separated from God's love. All right, so quickly, I want to go over just ways that we respond to this. And I'm going to go through these a lot quicker than I had in my notes for this. We admit that you're a sinner. We understand that as a sinner, we deserve death. We believe Jesus Christ died on the cross to save us from our sin, save us from death. And we repent. That's, that's turning around, that's doing a 180. That's, that's our response of turning from our sin and turning toward God. We repent and then we receive. We receive through faith in Jesus Christ, God's free gift of salvation. That should have been our response to when we hear the gospel. And that's the response that we 
that we want when we share the gospel with other people. And that's why we come to a day like today when we are celebrating the the Lord's table, when we celebrate communion together. Because communion is a time in which we remember what Jesus did for us. All right, I'm going to pause right there. I know some of you are like, wait, there's one more on my notes. You, You forgot one. I didn't forget it, okay, it's, it's there. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing eyes turning, and I just felt I needed to pause and say this. I know there's one that I didn't mention. We're going to come to it in a minute. But, but today we are going to celebrate communion together as a way of remembering what Jesus did for us. It, it's not just something that happened in the past. I mean, it did, and when we came to Jesus, that was something... That affected us then and it's affecting us now, but we want to remember that. It's something that we celebrate. And it's something that we do together as a family. And, and here at this church, we do this regularly on the first Sunday of the month um, to remember and celebrate what he did for us. And so in a minute, so I'm going to have you go back and we have on the back, on the side and on the back table and over here on this side too, uh, the different communion elements. And in a minute, like I said, I'm going to have you go back there and grab the elements and come back to the seat. Um, and we'll do this together. But communion, also known as the Lord's Supper, uh, is mentioned multiple times in the New Testament books of the Bible. And it refers to the acts of thanks and remembrance of the death of Christ in our relationship that we have with him through the new covenant. Now, the Bible tells us that communion is a permanent ordinance and command that was set in place by Jesus himself uh, that we should do until he comes back for us. And so that's why we, that's why we do this. That's why we celebrate together. So, um, so why don't you now take a moment and, and just in a, in a reverent attitude... Um, so go back to the tables and you can grab a, a, a cup and some bread for yourself and then come back to your seats and then we'll take it together. <laughs> 